Hi, how you doing, folks? It's Mick from Hard Tensions YouTube channel, and today we got a special guest on from a very infamous uh, part of California. How'd you like to introduce yourself? My name's Maddie Boy. I grew up in uh, Rodeo, California, which is in Contra Costa County. Uh, All right. So that's better known as Coco County uh, amongst the guys that, uh, right. You know, I was telling a story, man, when I was in prison, you know, I grew up in San Diego and I, I went to prison. I seen guys with Coco code tattooed on their stomachs and shit. And I was like, I didn't know what it was. You know, my wife grew up in Palo Alto. She didn't even know, you know, she, I never heard that called that, you know, and so I asked some guy, Hey man, what do you work for Coca-Cola company or what's going on? You know, and he said, nah, man, that's Contra Costa County, you know? So uh, once I got to the feds, everybody, they'd see the big Coco on my back and be like, Coco beach. Yeah. What yeah. The fuck is Coco beach. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah it's true. West coast. Yeah. So, um, so you, uh, did you grow up in uh, Contra Costa County? Yep. I spent my entire life in Rodeo, except for when I, um, once I started getting in trouble, I started getting outside of our little area. You know, it's like, uh, yeah. Coco County's huge, man. We ain't never have to go outside of Coco County to find whatever we was looking for. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, a, you know, it's right there in the Bay area and stuff. So, um, so did did you uh you grow up in like a normal house? Did you go to school? You have you, did you uh like like normal kids, normal families? You know, kids go to school, come home, mom and pops. You know all that kind of stuff. Nah. So uh, my mom and dad were both gang. Well, like I don't think like my mom was always wild, um, but then she met my dad, and then she became like a. Uh, even more wild, you know, my dad, my dad was in prison from, um, I think 69 to 75 for a, a robbery. And, uh, so when he came home, he met my mom and, uh, you know, I think my dad initially tried to start doing good. He, he was working at a, um, sugar plant up in, uh, Crockett, same area where I'm at in Contra Costa County. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he started going back to the old ways or whatever. So I grew up in a, um, I grew up in a drug dealing environment, man. Like fucking uh, everybody that I was around was gangsters. Um, yeah, right. I, I wasn't the, the kid that had uh, like posters of basketball players on the walls and stuff like that. I had pictures of, um, prison gang members all over the house and shit like that. It was, uh, yeah. you know, once my mom and my dad split up, my mom got married to the uh, president of the Sonoma County Hells Angels, man. It was just, um, our life was crazy. We was, um, yeah, the, the, the gangster lifestyle and everything like that was all we ever knew, you know? And it's like a lot of people will say that you had a choice when you started messing up and stuff like that. But it was like, and, and I'm not bashing my parents in any way. I know that people, like, yeah. uh, when you start living that lifestyle, it's easy to become like uh, blinded by by certain stuff and with greed or whatever you want to call it. But right, it was almost like we was um like taught to be gangsters, man. And uh, so um, how how that affect like your uh, like your daily life? Like, did you go to school? And I went to school until until ninth grade but even before ninth grade it was like me and my brother uh like i want to say my brother was selling because it, it was like in in uh elementary school we started selling candy and stuff like that <laughs> and then the candy went into to weed and then in between my eighth and ninth grade year one of the older homeboys was like man what the fuck are you selling weed for man you're parents are the biggest drug dealers in the in the area grab yeah. some of this meth let's start selling meth and wow it just went from there so i was sitting there buying drugs from my parents you know and um but i i started like uh i started getting like real bad into drugs in between my eighth and ninth grade year my parents split up so uh like me and my brother became more wild you know it's like my dad, my dad's presence kept us in check, 
But once my dad, because like my dad started going back and fucking up because like initially I feel like my dad was selling drugs and he was doing good. He was like making a lot of money and all that. He was partying once in a while and then he started partying hard. Right. So, uh, you know, my dad was like a, um, a playboy too. So he, he treated my mom bad, always had other women and stuff like that. But yeah. like I was saying, once they split up, me and my brother became worse in between my eighth and ninth grade year. I started doing drugs, the hard drugs. And then uh, once I be- once I got on meth, I became a, a monster, man. And right, you know, right. robbing, stealing. Um, I just became a bad person, man. And then um, it's like all my bad behaviors were spiraling out of control. My mom had dope money. So uh, like I, I was able to get into trouble and come in there with the fancy lawyers and I kept getting out of trouble. And, right. uh, but then when I was 20 years old, I ended up going to state prison for the first time. Um, right. Did a little four year sentence in, in Jamestown back in the late nineties. So was that like a uh, level two or did you go to the level three yard there? I went to the level three. All right. That's a Tuolumne, right? Yep. Yeah. 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 They ended up flipping that yard. They, they did, like after, uh, I don't know when they did, but when I was there, that yard was crazy, man. Yeah, so um, I heard it was all right there, but there was a few there was a few things. Uh, I knew a guy that beat some guy down in the cell and smashed a TV over his head and all kinds of shit. And, and uh, yeah, I heard, it was, I heard it would rock and roll a little bit. Yeah, them damn essays there were treacherous, man. Yeah, so... Um, I can relate to, because I was raised by my mom and my stepdad. My stepdad was a roofer, you know, Korean War veteran, you know, alcoholic. Um, you know, my family were squares and they were citizens. They weren't definitely not into drugs and all that. But, you know, I think, uh, I don't know if it, what's worth, uh, you know, uh, methamphetamine users or alcoholics, you know, because uh, alcoholics are pretty abusive. And uh, But when my stepdad was gone, the heavy hand of authority was gone. I, I kind of went wild myself, you know, it was like, fuck it. I'm going to go do my thing, you know? And, and, uh, my mom worked all day and came home at night. Like I come home from school, I'd be food in the oven on a timer, pop it out, ding, you know, you know, and go do my thing. So I can understand, I can relate to that. And, um, so when you got into meth, uh, Man, that's a big thing for a young guy, you know, like selling dope, you know, you snort crank. I used to snort crank and, 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 uh, you know, you feel invincible. You feel like, you know, uh, Superman kind of, you know, and, and, um, it destroys your personality. You know, you don't really realize it at the time, but, <clears throat> you know, you start, you start feeling like you're invincible. You can do whatever you want. Cause you get kind of that mentality going. Yeah, that stuff was poison for me, man. Mentally, I mean, I, it's like I, uh, I started believing my own hype I, is like a, a good way for me to say it. It's like I just, um, once that ball started rolling, man, I couldn't stop it. I started just that whole gangster image and stuff like that was intensified. And, right. um, you know, plus I, in, in my household, man, it's like I always seen the, like all the homeboys, especially like on our side of the uh, of the county, like the Richmond side of the county. All right. the homeboys would come to the house after they got out. They would kick it or whatever. And, you know, I, I would see them getting high and doing all that type of stuff. So in my young mind, I felt like this whole gangster image doing meth and doing drugs and selling drugs and doing all that type of shit all just blended to, together. So right. it was a, bro. And you want to know what's crazy. It's like the, the lifestyle we lived, the stuff was so it's like, it, it sounds goofy sometimes for me to say it, but like the, the, the way we was living was so natural to me. I did not realize like how uh, bizarre the stuff that like my parents was exposing me to and stuff like that until I was like 37 years old, man. That's like, yeah. uh, I was sitting with my brother and we was talking and my brother was like, bro, 
nothing about the way we was raised was normal. Right. You know, it's like, and and like um, I know when I came home, my nieces were still young, so I'm sitting there seeing them when they're 16 years old, and like the little stuff they're doing, and I was like, "Fuck, man!" When I was these kids' age, it was I had guns on me, dope on me. I was right. in and out of juvenile hall, drug programs. It was like, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. But like you said, it's normal, you know. It's like. It was normalized because you grew up around it, you know, and in, and like you were saying about your dad, you know, he started slowly getting worse and worse. He went from the sugar plant to, you know, and so experiencing that yourself, you can see how, you know, it go, it just escalates, you know. Yeah, it does. Drug use sure. and crime, it's normalized. Everyone's kind of like, hey, homie, like pat on the back and, you know, and if you had the dope sack, you know, you were uh you were probably a really popular guy, you know, and, and um, I remember when I was in prison, I was selling dope out of cell. He was from Oakland and uh, he got busted in like 1970. So he's a little older than me. And he said, look, we're going to sell this dope. And he said, uh, when you got dope, you don't have any friends. And he goes, when the dope's gone, the guys that are still around, those are your friends. Yeah. That's so I imagine you had a lot of uh, guys that, were your friends when you had this sack? Yeah, well, I think that like a lot of times, man, for, for me, because of uh, like that popularity that comes with being the knucklehead or being the guy with the bag and all that type of stuff. When I came home after my first uh, little four year bid, that that attention that I used to have and was now lacking, I feel like that was like one of the things that brought me back into the criminal lifestyle because it was like, I missed that attention. I missed that yeah. feeling of power and uh, everything that came with being the man, you know? And, yeah. and then my second go around, I wasn't under the influence of meth. So like uh, I had more money, I had more drugs, uh, just like that whole lifestyle was intensified when I was not fucked up on meth and, I just became. So you did a four-year bid. What? So what did you get busted for drugs? Did you do? Your time I got, so so. Uh, after after I turned eighteen, I got in a high-speed chase. Uh, they busted me with some some drugs. So, um, I was on probation, mm. and then I went on the run from probation. So they was chasing me down like my mom was uh, selling drugs and they kept coming to the house looking for me. And then um, they finally caught up. They raided the house. I fell asleep at my house is what happened. I wasn't even supposed to be there. I fell asleep and I was running hard. So I, when I fell asleep, I fell asleep hard. <clears throat> but, uh, the cops raided. They, um, they found 90 grams of meth in my mom's room. So they charged me, my brother and my mom for 30 grams a piece. Oh, wow. And, and uh, well, before that, though, so I'm still on the run. I'm in Solano County. I get pulled over. I get in an altercation with a uh, couple of the Benicia police officers. Um, I ended up bailing out under an alias name, you know. Uh, and then, so now I'm on the run for an altercation with the police officers. And then that's when the house in Rodale got raided and they charged my mom, me and my brother all for 90 grams or 30 grams a piece because they, she had 90. So uh, I ended up catching a two year sentence for the drugs that they found in the house. Um, I think my mom got some county jail time. My brother got like a um, suspended sentence or something. So complete your probation and and you'll be able to get off this like the, it'll never be on your record type stuff. Well, uh, I ended up going to San Quentin. And then while I was in San Quentin reception, they called me out to court for the altercation I got into with the police officers. So um, that ended up getting me four years, four months. My attorney thought it was just going to be a resistant arrest. But the cops ended up saying that I battered them. And then one of the cops got a bone spur in his leg. So my uh, yeah. my 
what was it like my battery on a police officer went from battery on a police officer to a battery on a police officer with a great bodily injury. Yeah. So I ended up getting the four years, four months at 85%. And uh, yeah, that was got to inflate it, you know? Yeah. Oh yeah. So uh, what do you think when you went to prison? What, what, what was your, uh, I mean, you already been involved with, and I'm sure you've been around violence and stuff on the streets too, because, um, that lifestyle, you know, you see a lot of violence is involved with that. And, um, so now you, you you get to reception center and West what West Block or, uh, and then you you got sent on off to Jamestown. How how do you feel about your prison experience that first time? Uh, honestly, man, and I I think that when I say stuff like this, it kind of uh, skips right over people because people won't understand it, but. When I finally got to prison, I, I was I wanted to go to prison, man. It was like that was part of my plan. It was like uh, I wanted to be the guy that was on the the wall in my mom's house, you know, with the tattoos everywhere. And um, like my mom, like my mom's story is a whole story in itself, man. My mom, once yeah. my mom and my dad split up, my mom started corresponding with the people that my uh my dad was in prison with, right? So um, I corresponded with these guys. They sent me and my brother uh, and my sister like blankets, quilted blankets and stuff like that. So um, like, this is what I wanted to be. You know what I mean? I wanted that yeah. reputation as these gangsters did and, and all that type of stuff. So right. Um, when, I, when I was finally on my way to prison, it was like, I was anticipating it instead of like being nervous about what I was going to see and all that type of stuff, because I knew like I was going to know everybody there, you know what I mean? Especially like the people where I was from. So, um, bro, like the violence of it and all that type of stuff, the, the violence and everything that me and my brother was exposed to at a young age, that shit was like, um, that wasn't a big deal to me, man. It was, uh, and like I said, it was like I, I it was felt normalized. Like I, it was normalized. It was normalized. And it was like there was there was um at no point when I I mean obviously I get there, I don't know where I'm going into or what I'm going into. So I, I was like the nervous of the not knowing uh like where I'm going or stuff like that. But it was like as far as being um nervous about the type of violence or stuff like that I was going to see in there. That's never crossed my mind. Yeah. So um, you did your first term and then you said um, your second time around, you weren't under the influence of meth. So when you got out, um, uh, so what you, you quit using or. Well, I, so I came home, uh, I went in in 97, came home in 2001. Right. And, uh, I started working as a pipe fitter. And then, um, I ended up becoming a insulator at the Richmond refinery. Right. And, um, this was like in September, bro. So I, I worked from September till about October and I, I didn't stop working, but October, November, I started getting back into the game. Right. Um, started selling little bits of drugs, you know, and then I started doing a little bit of the party and I would take a volume or whatever and drink a little bit. And when I say sober, I wasn't completely off drugs. I was just not on meth. And right. I felt like meth was the, uh, the drug that just like really made me a bad, bad person. So right. um, it was like, I was just, pointing out the fact that this time around I wasn't smoking meth and just doing the riding around in stolen cars. Now I was riding around in nicer cars and, and had money in my pocket. Um, right. And then I ended up quitting my job and uh, just was a knucklehead, man. I was partying every day, um, selling drugs every day. You know, I was just living that life, man. So you got, um, did, did you get arrested for that or you just get violated or what happened? So, uh, in 2003, I ended up, yeah. So 2003, 
I got a DUI. They sent me back to prison for nine months. And then I came home after I, I went to uh, Solano level two yard for my little violation. And then I came home. But this time around, there was no intermission of me wanting to do good or thinking that I was going to do the right thing. The, the day I came home from that one, I was already in the game. Yeah. And uh, so I was running hard. And then so I was only out for six months, too. So I got out at the very end of February. And then from February to September, I was uh, I was running hard. And then I, I took a trip. I tried to transport um, a large quantity of cocaine from California to Chicago. And we yeah. got a, a pulled over in uh, Utah. And that's when I caught my 150 month sentence in the feds. All right. Yeah. You know, uh, <laughs> I, I've seen stuff on Utah, man. There, there, I guess a lot of people, uh, try that. And I guess law enforcement's aware of that. So that, that I-80, man, that I-80 is a cocaine highway, man. <laughs> so. Yeah, so, yeah. So you got pulled over by, uh, law enforcement in Utah. They, Wow. So that must have been an experience because now you're not in California. Uh, Bro, it, uh, what was that like, jail out in Utah? Did you go to a federal place or a state? Well, they they, they mixed the, the state with the federal guys in, like, the county jail. So right. I was around all them guys in Utah. In Utah, the jails is is definitely not what you expect. Like I, I was, um, so the, the DEA agent that arrested me and my co-defendant, he came to pick us up because the county jail that we was initially being held at, um, doesn't hold federal inmates. So they had to bring us to another county jail. But while we're on the, the drive from the Park City County Jail to the Salt Lake City County Jail, the, uh, the cop told me and my Cody friend, and he was like, oh, you guys ain't going to be prepared for what you're about to see in this county jail. And I, in my mind, I'm like, fuck, man, we're from California. What the fuck is the difference going to be here? And um, it, it wasn't like the county jail. Well, like in 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 the Contra Costa County Jail, it was like. Um, back back when I was there. In, in Martinez, it was open. Like we wasn't locked down all the time. Now, now from what I hear, you're locked down like 23 hours a day. But our county jail was wide open, man. And and when you walked into the the module, it was like walking into the the state prison. You know, you had the white boys at this TV, the blacks on the their TV and right. stuff like that. So uh, Salt Lake County Jail was completely locked down. Um, Dudes were yelling out of their cells and stuff like that. But uh, the white boys in Utah go hard, man. They got a crazy reputation, man. And it was just like, it just wasn't what I expected. I thought I'd, uh, you know, you hear about Utah and Mormons and stuff like yeah. that. It's, yeah. It wasn't like that, man. It was, uh, Utah is crazy as shit. And white boys out there go hard, bro. It's like, yeah. Um, yeah. I say a, a lot of times I'll say like the smaller places always got like got that chip on their shoulder. Like they have to go extra hard because they want that respect. And right. that, that's that's how Utah reminds me. It's like um, right. it's not a big place, man. But I've heard a lot of stuff about uh, white dudes from Utah. And then there's that video of some guy uh, beating some guy to death in a day room and all that stuff. And. I think that was in Utah. I forgot his name. Troy Kell or something. Troy Kell. That dude's like a legend out there, man. Yeah. So, and they have they have their own prison gang out there. White dudes. I forgot the name of it, but uh, they got a few. What, but Sack is the big one. Yeah. From what I hear, they're pretty. Uh, they're pretty rough guys. Some of them. The fools go hard, bro. I was I was in the um, county jail with one of the Sack dudes when they was going through their little Rico trial, man. And them dudes are, they're about that life. Yeah. 
So, but they, she's been out of county jail for a while, and um, you, she got a hundred and something months from the hundred and fifty months, and then from uh from the county jail, I've sent to Arizona the um FCI in Tucson, and All right, the FCI in Tucson, man, I'm telling you, that place was uh, we we had we had crazy times in that facility, man. It was so, uh, uh, what level was that? That was like a level three, the FCI. Okay, okay. And so now you're in prison with guys from all over the country or what? Yeah. So you guys yeah, went I mean, gangsters from the East Coast and, you know, bikers from all over. And, yeah, so um, so did you meet guys from uh, other states and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, you know, I, uh, I met people from all over, you know, because, like, one, once you leave – uh, like once I left the Utah County Jail when the feds picked me up, I went to Oklahoma City, which Oklahoma City is like the transfer center for all of the feds. Right. So, and, I mean, if obviously if you're on the West Coast, I think, and you're staying on the West Coast, there's little hubs or whatever out here that they'll they'll station you out and then they'll bus you to where you're going. But the majority of the people all start in Oklahoma city. And from there you're flown out to whatever location right. you're ending up going. But right. bro, I met people from all over the world, you know, and it's a, it's like, I, I was watching the, um, the Unabomber thing. Right. And they right. talked about how they busted him by how he talked or like how he wrote certain things. And um, I thought that was unique because in the feds, you find out how everywhere, like different people say different things, you know, like somebody will say, hey, you want a Coke? And a Coke is universal for a soda, you know, and it's like not necessarily saying Coke, but and so forth and so on. But yeah, I met people from all over the United States, man. It was kind of, uh, it was kind of crazy. The so how do, uh, just curious, like how do guys that are uh, involved with the uh, legal, uh, you know, lifestyles of other states, how do they just, how do they view guys from California, California prison system? I'm just kind of uh, curious, you know? Well, uh, the, it, it like varies sometimes. Like uh, the far East guys don't have like the politics that we have. Well, not very many places have the politics like we do in uh, California. So right. uh, like the uh, it's crazy because a lot of people that aren't from California don't like California. They feel right. like, uh, like we have this little chip on our shoulder and stuff like that. Um, yeah. So especially in the feds, you know what I mean? Oh, you guys come to the yards. You guys think you're fucking hot stuff and all that type of stuff. Right. But, um, you know, I, I feel like a, it, it's hard to not like people from California because the majority of us, uh, you know, have heart, man. We're willing to go and, and, and like be that lead person or, or well, there's definitely we, some uh, some really good dudes from California, especially like you know talking about prison. There's there are some good dudes in the California prison system. Um, but you know, I, you know, I did 38 years, and I I got to tell you, um, the first half of my prison time was not that bad. There were a lot of really good dudes, but the second half of my prison time it got really fucked up. And like um. You know, growing up, I was always taught, like, you know, you don't commit a, a felony without making a profit and stuff like that. And so a lot of guys in prison, they were gangsters. They were down for making money. They would get loaded, but that wasn't their main objective in life. It wasn't just to get loaded. It was like to make money and live good. And and towards the end of my term, it got down to where guys were just committing crimes just to get high. And but all the really solid dudes were locked up in the hole. Uh, they would lock you up for being a, a predatory behavior, even if you weren't in a gang. If you were checking someone's paperwork, you got caught, told on why they would lock you up as a predator. And so prison got really fucked up, man, in, in California towards the last of my sentence. I think it's kind of changing now. But um, there's some guys in California prisons, man, that will go. You know, like the white crip I interviewed, you know, you, you're familiar with him. Uh, he was talking to a white crip from Texas, and the guy said, you know, I think I would have been all right in California prison. And he said, hey, look, and he told him, look, the white dudes in California, um, 
if they're tasked for a mission to get you because you're a white crypt and they go out to the yard and they're the only white dude on the yard and there's 200 blacks out there, they're going to get you. They're or or try. So don't think that you could have came out here and just been, you know, smooth sailing because they would have got you. Yeah. And that's kind of the mentality of guys out here. And, uh, and I interviewed a prison guard who's uh, retired. He's got his own channel. And I asked him, you know, what, out of all the races in California prison system, you know, which guys are the, and he said, you know, by far the whites are, are the most savage. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Bro, it's like, uh, I, my dad was a beast, man. Like, uh, my dad was like the most, um, like the bravest individual I've ever seen in my life. You know what I mean? It was like, uh. I always feel like there's two types of people. There's the type of people. Well, uh, there's two types of people with heart, in my opinion. There's the people that will take the stand and if provoked, will go. And then there's that type of people that as soon as they sense anything, they react. You know what I mean? And and my dad was that reactor. And um, I I don't know, man. It's just like... uh, California is full of uh, it, it's not full, but you got you got them guys, man, that 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 uh that got that reputation, man, and it's just fucking uh well it's like there's a standard in California. Like we have a lot of racial politics, we have a lot of uh you can't do this, you can't do that. If you're in prison for this, that, or the other, you know, you're gonna be a victim, you're gonna get killed, stabbed, whatever. Um so other states they don't have uh racial politics like we do they don't have um you know it's not like it's not like you know and i i don't understand it on some hand i and on other hands i do but california is a pretty hard system you know and yeah. it, it's like it says a standard and even the guy that's just a regular dude he's gonna live up to that standard you know yeah. which is you know but but so I grew up around like uh, uh, like my dad was prideful and everything like that. But it wasn't until I went to prison that I really realized because it was like, uh, you know, I my my lady did this little class and it, it talked about like how TV and, and certain stuff that we watch kind of morphs your um, impression or your outlook on certain people. And then you see certain movies or certain shows where the white dudes are nerdy and you know, like fucking, uh, they'll they'll go to the uh, black neighborhood. Like in, in, I think it's a minister society. White dude goes down there. I think he wants a stolen car or whatever. And then when he's leaving, the dude kicks him in his ass and the, the white dude apologizes for him kicking him in his ass and so forth and so on. So you get this red, you, this like idea like that that uh white boys ain't as violent as other races or white boys won't go like other races but uh bro i got to state prison and and there were incidents where i i sat there and i was like man this is this is unique man these fucking white boys are ready to go it doesn't fucking matter and it it like uh it gave me a, a different like outlook on on white boys i know that like the white boys i was running around with would go but i i didn't act you know that's just in a little isolated area so i didn't know how it was on a larger scale but right. i remember um we was on the yard and some some uh skinheads came up to my homeboy and was like hey you guys just got a homeboy in here that says he's running black it was a white dude so uh the homeboys went up to the black shot callers and was like man this white dude can't stay here man and and uh there was a lot of black dudes on that yard man and and initially the the black dudes was like well the dude is running black and and we're gonna let him stay so uh we all went to the yard man and and like i was blown away on how many white boys showed up to the yard and the black shot caller started talking to my homeboys because the dude was from Coco County. And uh, 
I remember my homeboy saying, hey, you know, and my homeboy worked with these guys in PIA for years. So right. he, he told him, oh, man, if this guy comes to the yard, man, it's going down. No matter how how this has to unfold, this guy can't stay here, man. So they they thought about that for a few minutes and was like, you know what, man, it's not worth it. We're not going to go down for this white boy and da 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 da. But yeah, um, it it was impressive, man. It, it um it gave me like a newfound respect for how the white boys move, man. Yeah, I was in uh I was in Lancaster uh, prison, level four on the Sea Yard, and um. They brought a white crip in there. And, you know, at that time, you know, policy was, you know, no white crips, no white bloods. And, you know, things are different now. There's a hands off policy on all that stuff now. But at the time, you know, um, so he knew he was going to be headed for a wreck. And he tried to cut this friend of mine, Johnny. Johnny was a punk rocker from Orange County and never been to prison, got an altercation on the street, shot some guy at 20 years, you know. And so, uh he walked up to johnny and like cut his sleeve of his jacket with a razor or some shit you know like trying to get out the yard or something i don't know and so uh you know we went in for yard recall and we came it was like hey mandatory yard you know and they run upper lower yard you know upper tier lower tier stuff but everyone came out and my celly at the time just for a few weeks he was a little short guy he was a christian guy and he goes uh well, I'm a Christian, but uh, I'm going to have to go out there. I said, yeah, you're going to go out there. We got out there. What do I do? I, and me and this guy, Rick, told him, you just stand by us, you know. But he was there, you know. And and anyways, uh, you know, we some guys talked to the blacks. And we said, you know, uh, they should go one-on-one. -on -one and uh, and uh, if not, uh, we're going to fuck all you guys up. We're outnumbered like 15 to 1, you know. Um, yeah, so, yeah, I mean, it's a matter of, um, you know, if you get ran over once, uh, it's never going to stop. Oh yeah, for sure. You know, shit. Well, I was in the, uh, in the feds and a good friend of mine, like his, his celly, his celly and some older, uh, Paisa and in the feds, bro, my Lord, like. There was, um, let me see here, man. So I think we had the Tucson yard, the FCI in Tucson was small. Wasn't a, a very big yard. So maybe 500 people were on the yard. Yeah. And, and bro, if, if 400 of them wasn't Paisa, like Hispanic wow. from Mexico. Yeah. So it, it, those guys were so deep on that yard. It was crazy, man. But. So um, I had a real, real close partner that was Cuban and the Cuban dude lived with the uh, with the Hispanic shot caller. So him and his celly were friends with me, you know. So Cuba worked with me in the, the warehouse. So like we, we had a bond. So but Cuba calls me over and he says, hey, Maddie, my celly wants to talk to you. Can you come over here for a minute? So I go over there and he's like, hey, <clears throat> like I have to do like a little history on this. So so my my partner from Wyoming had uh, some Paisa neighbors that were being like loud after 10 o'clock and stuff like that. So my my partner was knocking on his uh, wall, told the dude, you know, hey, respect or something. And the Paisa said something derogatory towards him. So my homeboy came and told me I went and got with the shot caller. The shot caller was like, hey, can we give this guy a warning? He ain't never been to jail. He doesn't know how politics work, so forth and so on. And my homeboy said no. So uh, they ended up jumping on the guy to reprimand him. So now fast forward to this incident to where my my homeboy's celly threw this older dude's cup away. And like somebody seen him do it. So anyways, they came to me and was like, hey, Maddie, you know, uh, the Cuban was the interpreter because the Hispanic dude didn't speak English. Right. So he, said, he was like, hey, man, you guys have to do something to this guy 
because you guys didn't give us the opportunity to give him a warning. So we're not going to give you guys the opportunity, so forth and so on. So you guys got to get this dude off the yard or it's going to go down. So this was at night when they're telling me this. So the following morning, I get up and I go over to my partner and I'm like, hey, man, the Pisces want your celly off the yard. And my my homeboy said, then, bro, I woke this fool up and he was like, not a chance. And I said, well, get on your boots, homeboy, because they're outside waiting for us. And I'll be shitting you not, bro. I I, I walked out. <laughs> I, seen, I seen all these Pisces, bro. And I was like, oh, man. And it was it was like uh, there, there was never a moment where I was like, fuck, man, maybe I shouldn't go outside. <laughs> you know, he's like, yeah. 200 yeah. Pisces out here right now salivating yeah. and there's and and bro it ended up being like five white dudes out there surrounded by all these Hispanics man and and uh you know after the fact I was the the feeling that I had was like man that was that was that was dope you know five five white dudes was willing to stand up against all these uh Pisces in that it was yeah. a good thing. But I'm telling you what, in that moment I thought I was gonna fucking die, man. I was like, um Yeah. That feeling was crazy, man. We was fortunate yeah. that my my partner had the gift to gab enough to to talk them guys out of their tree, but and and the white dude ended up staying on the yard. But it, it was uh and bro, you know how that shit goes on the lower level places that the knives are like Fuck yeah, yeah. It's like you're not you're not dealing with some little rinky dink knife you're dealing with fucking uh welding rods and shit like that I remember i remember one time my partner said hey maddie i just found a knife on the yard you wanted and i was like yeah sure bring him motherfucker brought me a fucking 12 inch i hey i told that motherfucker i said no i don't want that <laughs> he's, he's yeah. like man I don't, what do you want me to do with it i said shit i don't know but yeah. <laughs> I said, homie, that thing, I could stab somebody and hit somebody behind him. Yeah. Pin so, him to a wall. Yeah, but. So you, you did you spend all your time right there in Arizona? So Arizona, that, that yard didn't have the uh, RDAP program. So, and the RDAP program is a drug program. Or no, is it the RDAP program? What, what's it called in, in California? TDAC or something. Okay, so it is RDAP. So in, in the feds, they give you a year off if you go through their nine-month drug program. Uh, FCI Tucson didn't have it, so I put in a transfer to go to Oxford, Wisconsin, because we had some people leave there. And, you know, everybody, everybody was like, hey, sending out messages to everybody trying to figure out, excuse me, which yard. <laughs> you could go to that would give you the full year off your sentence because it was like on the West coast shit was so backed up from people trying to get into this program to get their year off and everything like the likelihood of you being able to get in, in time to get your full uh, year off your sentence and then get halfway time was like minimal. So everybody was like, Oh, well, where to go, where to go. So somebody left was like, man, Maddie, they're fucking getting the year off their sentence and they're getting a whole year in the halfway house. So it was like, everybody was trying to go to facilities like that. So I was fortunate. I ended up getting to that facility in Oxford. Uh, Oxford was a nice facility as far as like the facility goes. Um, they had weights, you know, it was freezing fucking cold. I, I've never been anywhere that was that cold in my entire life. Yeah. But you want to talk about a fucking culture, culture shock. It was like in in the Midwest, it's entirely different than the, the West Coast, man. But right. uh, you know, I met a, a lot of good white boys out there and um on that particular yard, like there wasn't no Serenos. Yeah. So you know, like I get there, I'm from California, uh, find out there's Northanios that are there from my county, you know, and it's like, oh, what's up, homeboy? <laughs> Fucking, you're sitting there like, uh, it's not like the state prison, but um, the feds was different, man. But being in, in um, Wisconsin was nothing like being like on the West Coast. Oh, is that still a level three? Yeah. 
And so now what do you got guys from like the Midwest, East part of the country? And Yep. And like, so how long were you there? I was there for two years or whatever. I wasn't there for very long. Thank God. So this program you took, was that to just like uh, drug counseling for you or is that to become a drug counselor or what well, was it? It was like to, to, uh, for my substance abuse or whatever it, Right. Had a uh, self help. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Encouraged by the opportunity to get a year knocked off your sentence. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, I went through this program before I got out to a long term offender program. And that, and that, that's the incentive, you know, is, um, you know, I know you're familiar with California. So uh, guys that had life sentences weren't getting out for over 20 years. Nobody got out. And so, the parole board started the uh, long-term offender program. And my train of thought was the parole board started this program. They must want you to go through it before they're going to release you, or you have a better chance to get, get out. So the incentive is freedom. You know I mean? Get out a little early. Sure. I mean, that's a no brainer, you know, Yeah. <laughs> but, but it's, you know how that shit goes, man. No, nobody, nobody changes until uh until they're ready or whatever and right. i tell a lot of people that um when i got when i got locked up my my behavior never changed man it's like um right. i got to i got to the fci over there in tucson and i i kept i immediately started trying to do the same shit that got me into the place in the first place right. and uh I remember calling home, man. I, I got on a cell phone and I called home because uh, they had just taken the tobacco out of the prisons. Right. So somebody was like, hey, I got three three packs of cigarettes. And I was like, man, I could make some money on these. So I called home and my brother, I could tell something was wrong with my brother. And my brother told me, he goes, uh, man, mom's dying. And I was like, uh, fuck, man. It was like I was like the the fucking instead of sitting there and talking to my brother about it we're getting ready my mom this fool just told me my mom was dying and like i was like bro i've already made this transaction with this person i need you to complete this transaction send this fool whatever it was for the packs of cigarettes and my brother got quiet and he was like man bro and my and my brother was a gangster too you know what i mean but in this fool's opinion he's like what the fuck, man? I send you, I send you the max amount of money that you could get to spend at, at commissary. You know, uh, no matter what you want, if you ask for it, I send it to you. And he goes, right. and I don't understand like how for somebody that could have whatever they want without getting into trouble still wants to get into trouble. You know right. what I mean? It was right. like, and, and I look back on that a lot of times, bro. And I didn't, I don't understand like, because me and my mom were close, you know what I mean? I would have thought that uh, I would have reacted different, um, maybe broke down or whatever. And I tell a lot of people, like, um, at, at a certain point into my term, and I know talking about a 10-year sentence for somebody that's done, like, almost four times that is uh, kind of silly or whatever, but... No, you know, 10 years is 10 years, man. It's but a at a certain time. point, yeah, at a certain point, I feel like um, I became emotionally detached. So, like, so my brother tells me my mom's dying. Then, like, you know, everybody's waiting for my mom to pass away. Then I get an email from my sister telling me to call home. So I call home. My dad uh, took a whole bunch of pills ended up in a coma. So, and it's like, I'm hearing all this shit and I'm like, fuck, my dad ends up getting taken off life support machine, dies. And then nine days later, my mom passes away from her cancer. And it was like, fuck man, why, why am I not feeling like uh, devastated? Why am I not sitting in my cubicle crying or, you know, like doing stuff like that? So it was like, Bro, I started reading books that like uh, were like emotional books, like something that would yank the the like the tear jerking type of things just to see if 
it was like I wanted to still feel normal. I didn't want to feel right. like I didn't have feelings or whatever. So, um, but so you, uh, yeah, sorry about your loss there, you, your parents, man. Um, so you recognized that you were like emotionally detached from what was going on. Yeah. And, um, but so my, and even after they passed away, man, my, my criminal behaviors never did change. You know, uh, my partners, I had a, an Islander partner named OJ and my partner, Randy started this, this, uh, class in, in Arizona over there called courage to change. And what it did was took like some, some guys that had like uh, great reputations on the compound, people that, uh, people respected and looked up to no matter what race they were, you know, these guys were like stand up dudes and, you know, stand up dudes. I don't give a fuck what kind of hate you have towards anybody. If right. you, if you recognize that somebody's an authentic, good dude, there's a, like a mutual respect there. So right. these guys started this program and uh, like my partner, Randy, he got up there and and asked everybody, you know, what would you do if if you seen somebody attacking your mom or like whoever whoever was close to you, you know, the closest people to you in your life, whoever that person was or those people were, what would you do if you seen a dog attacking them? And you know, the consensus was what well, we would uh, kill the dog. You know what I mean? And 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 then my partner kind of got animated and was like, well, you guys are the dog. You know what I mean? You know what it does to your people out there on the streets doing doing time. A lot of people don't realize this, but doing time is easy. And even even uh, I mean, I know that you're missing out on a whole bunch of shit, but it's you you know what to expect. The, the, the stress. The highest level of stress that we have is staying alive, you know what I mean? Not 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 getting stabbed and all that, but the yeah. everyday normal responsibilities that everybody else has, we don't have. So right. we don't have to worry about waking up and uh, right. thinking about whether or not our job will be there when we, when we get up and just everything that goes into that. So, you know, the, that thought process at that time didn't really register, but like the more mature I got, the more I realized that, the people that are really doing time are the people that love us. The people that go to sleep every night worrying about whether or not we're going to get stabbed in prison or how safe we are and stuff like that. And, and mentally and physically, that shit breaks people down, man. Uh, the, uh, and even even before prison, being out. In the